thank you for your testimony today, and I agree with you that American farmers are losing a competitive edge on the global marketplace. It seems like there are two parts to this problem. First, other countries are stacking the deck against American imports, whether that is Mexico banning certain GMO crops or Canadian subsidies to undercut American farmers. But perhaps more importantly, our government isn't doing enough to help American businesses, farmers in particular. We are imposing ridiculous regulatory burdens on labor, environmental standards, and a laundry list of other areas. We have created a policy towards farmers that is definitely not America first. In your testimony, you said money goes where money can be made. With that in mind, do you have any further examples or predictions going forward of how states like New York or America in general are losing agriculture production and resources to competitors because of bad policy? Well, thank you for the question, and I am very concerned. We are just stacking the deck against the American farmer, um, particularly those that have uh, in more intense of labor needs with uh, fruits and vegetables than dairy. I believe that uh, in New York State, where we're a little more traditional with family farms who would have a handful of employees or maybe even 10 or 15, that the uh, regulations are looking at that they're going to get pushed out of business. I'm, I'm scared for them. I have uh, a little more mechanized, but as I learned in the processing vegetable business when I was uh, the major shipper for Bird's Eye Foods, being the last guy standing doesn't make you very smart. Everybody else moved on first. And uh, fortunately, I stayed in the dairy business, and that's my primary business today along with the cabbage. But. Um, we, we have to do something to stay competitive. I mean, there's talk of an E-Verify system in Washington right now. Folks, 70 or 80% of the employees on dairy farms in the United States will struggle with an E-Verify system. Uh, the, 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 the hospitality business and, and food businesses in a lot of our big cities, this didn't happen overnight. It's evolved over the last 30 years. And we need to listen to small business and hear them and understand that we need a comprehensive immigration bill that addresses this. Some of the finest families in my community, or my employees with me for 20 years, that I'm not sure they can live up to an E-Verify system. And it's a very, very big concern. Um, as far as GMO and whatnot, I mean, it's just a, it's just a, a, a playing card by Mexico right now. There is absolutely no validity at all in any of their concerns about GMO. Sound science is how we're put together, doing our cropping and whatnot with as minimal a carbon footprint as possible, but a lot of cover crops is what we're about. And with that, we need modern farming practices. Yeah, I've seen it in my own district in Florida. We've seen it after NAFTA was passed. We've lost uh, tomato growers because they can obviously produce it a lot cheaper without the labor standards, without the environmental standards in Mexico than they can here in the United States. Uh, in general, American farmers and businesses follow the rules. If something is prohibited, they don't do it. But in Mexico or in China, rules and bans are more of suggestions. When something is banned in Mexico or China, it often just means someone needs to be bribed. Businesses don't really play by the rules. This is also true for environmental and human rights regulations as well. Uh, Mr. Romano and uh, Mr. Heminger, if you want to touch on it too, uh, can you speak to the unlevel playing field created when countries like Mexico and China implement rules that are followed by American businesses but aren't actually enforced against or followed by their own businesses? Mr. Romano. Yeah, so um, I think it's a great question when you think about how we're producing in the United States. Specifically, we actually have a, a plant in China as well. So. When we think about how we bought that plant back in 2019 and part of another acquisition, and that's a small facility that we struggle to compete with because when we, using our technology and our resources the way we need to invest in the U.S., we use those same principles in China, and we find that we're very uncompetitive because of the things that we're doing as we manage our production to ensure that we're treating the environment the, environment the appropriate way. Well, and you spoke about the need to consider increased tariffs on China in regards to the titanium dioxide. Can you speak further as to why and when dealing with unscrupulous trading partners such as China, a simple free market approach doesn't always work and economic tools such as tariffs are necessary? Yes. Yeah, so I mentioned that uh, as the tariffs have been put in place, exports into the U.S. have halved. Uh, I'll give you another example of another country that's a big uh, where we supply a lot of material into is in India. So in that same time frame, India has a market that consumes about 400,000 tons a year, imports 
in 2017 were 89,000 tons. They're now 210,000 tons. So the, the import duties that have been put in place along with the 301 have helped us manage our business um, and we struggle to do that in Europe as well. So Europe is another country that we've got three production facilities in and the Chinese imports in that area have gone up 82% since 2017.